Pace and his version of Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. As I mentioned in the first hour of today's programme, we have a very special guest with us between now and one o'clock, and that is Elio Pace, who you've just heard. He's a singer, he's a songwriter, he's a piano player. He was the house band on uh, Weekend Wogan, some of you might remember that. He tours the country doing a Billy Joel songbook. He also does an Elvis Presley show. And last weekend, Bank Holiday weekend, he pulled off an open air concert and there were 200 socially distanced spectators. The first one on the Sunday evening sold out so quickly that they had to have a second one on the Monday evening. We'll talk about all of that between now and one o'clock. But first of all, how has it been for Elio, a musician in the COVID-19 world? Tough, very tough. I I wasn't... (laughs) To be honest, there's a side of it that has been a godsend and that is the being able to be at home okay being able to sleep in my own bed being able to um uh, see my daughter every single weekend for week after week after week after week and uh, and being able to to tidy up administrative things that I've wanted to do for ages and get projects I've wanted to sort out you know uh, that's there's been there's been some good positives to that but it is no fun having your earnings completely wiped out and and they were completely taken out every single gig every single tour gone um with 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 nothing in sight at the moment really uh, in the short term of, of of helping out and which is why when this opportunity to do this show in Mattersea came up I absolutely jumped at it so how did that come about? Um, it was, it was August the 7th and I had received an email during the night. I woke up to an email from Crystal Cruises, one of the most, if not the most prestigious and wonderful cruise line in the world. Beautiful couple of ships they have, which I've been very fortunate enough to frequent a lot over the last three or four, five years. And, um, I had some dates in the book with them which is supposed to start in May of this year, but that got postponed. I was supposed to, believe it or not, they've asked me to front their Elton John production show. Okay. So, um, yeah, I love Elton John and, 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 you know, on these ships, they have these big, huge, huge concerts and, and, and and lovely big arenas and big venues and stuff. And they have this, this show called Rocket Man, which they would like me to front with dancers and explosives and a great band and backdrops and everything. And they just need me to front it and sing Elton John songs. That contract was supposed to start in May 2020. It, they put it back to June, then it was July, and then, and then they stopped putting it back, and there was a big long gap. And then, as I say, on August the seventh, I got an email saying, "Sorry, Elio, that's it. There will be no cruising for anybody for the rest of this year, at least." It was on that day I sat outside in the sunshine with Amy, we were having a cup of tea, discussing all sorts of things, and you know, just chewing it up and going what you know what are we going to do what what are we going to do and my lovely friend steve piper turned up now he he lives in in the house opposite and uh he turned up and he saw me sitting there and hey Elliot, how are you going i said hello steve how are you going so we we approached each other and stood two meters away from each other and uh and i said to him yeah it's uh you know <laughs> you know we're healthy and it's sunny so, you know, things could be a lot worse. And he said, how's it going, mate? Really? I said, oh, it's, it's pretty bad, to be honest. I've just, just today got, got noticed that I've lost my last gig of the year, my last possibility that something may have kicked off in November. But no, that's all gone. It's all gone. Everything. As I said, I will not have earned a penny since my birthday, February the 8th this year. And, uh, and I said, I'm, and I jokingly said, I'm, I'm seriously considering ringing up a few of my mates and charging them 50 quid to come over and listen to me sing in the back garden, you know? And he said verbatim, why don't we do that in my back garden? I said, what? He said, well, you know, my house, you've been there. And I said, yeah. He said, I've got 22 acres at the back of my house. 
it's an open field. Why don't we, why don't we do exactly that and put a show on? I said, when? He said, as soon as we can, uh, you know, before the sun goes. And I was like, he said, let me go and talk to Juliet, my wife. And he went inside and he came back 10, 15 minutes later. He said, yeah, I've spoken to Juliet and uh, she's up for it. Do you want to do it? I said, are you serious? I said, a proper outdoor concert, you know, with, you know, with, we have to get licenses. We're going to have to get staging and, and marquee. And he said, we've got a marquee. We've got, you know, we can turn it around and we can, we can do this. Do you want to do it? I said, yes, yes, I want to do this. And when are we going to do it? I said, well, what about bank holiday weekend? He went, okay, let's do it then. I said, that means the tickets have to go on sale by next Friday, the 14th. And he went, let's do it. I said, let's do it. I got on the phone. I got on a WhatsApp group to my band. I said, guys, we're going to do a gig. Who's up for it? Who's available? And of course, they're all like, are you serious? Yeah. And that's how it came about, Harvey. It was it was one of the most extraordinary events. And in three weeks, from August the 7th, that first show, which I'm very um, honoured that you came to, by the way. I'm very flattered that you came, Harvey. And uh, uh, August the 30th, Sunday, August the 30th, 2020, was the show. And um, And that first show sold out very quickly, didn't it? 18 minutes. Now, we we decided that 200 people would be the maximum for this show. We could have fitted more in, but Stephen Juliet quite rightly said, let's not bite off more than we can chew. Let's not fill this place so that we're going to have to bring extra people in and pay them to look after a huge crowd of 500, 600 people. We can manage 200 ourselves because the whole point of this Harvey was to make some money right so that so that I could earn some money so the band could earn some money so my lighting guy and my sound guy could earn some money and by the way for the record Steve and Juliet wanted absolutely nothing for it so we put the tickets on sale on the 14th of August Friday the 14th and at 10 o'clock in the morning on my website exclusively on my website all I did was I did I did a couple of Facebook posts and uh, social media posts, I should say. And it sold out in 18 minutes, those 200. We're not talking 20,000, but for me, selling out 200 people who obviously were as desperate as we were to get out and, and just be human again. And I find it quite moving, to be honest. It was amazing. And then we had a second night on, on uh, Bank Holiday Monday. On Bank Holiday Monday. Yeah. Uh, well, as soon as that sold out in 18 minutes... We, we literally went into it. I mean, Steve came running over because he was across the road and he went, how's it going? I went, how's it going? I said, it's, it's sold out. He said, are you, are you joking me? I said, it's sold. We've, we've, we've had to take the, the, the button off the website for people to stop clicking it to buy. He said, that's incredible. What we, he said, we're going to have to do a second night. You know, he, he just went, we'll, we'll do a second night. I said, Steve, are you serious, mate? And this is me out of my window down to him on the street. You know, he said, just, just do a second night. I said, all right. Okay. So I called my band and I said, guys, should we do it? And they said, yep, let's do it. Let's do it. And that's, and we did that. And, and that's how it happened. And how did it feel to be back on stage after, after the long layoff? Um, it was very emotional. It was very emotional. It was very moving. Because yeah, um, you were almost tearing up at the end, more so yeah. the first night, but both nights. Yeah, and I'm not. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed. I'm. I'm, I'm sort of emotional just thinking about it now. Um, just these people. This these wonderful, wonderful music loving people. These Billy Joel loving people who, not just Billy Joel loving people, just the people that just love live music and have supported me, whether I'm doing my Elvis show or whether I'm singing my own material or or whether I'm putting Weekend Wogan posts out, whatever it is, these lovely, lovely people that, that, that seem to enjoy what I do, that love my music and have bought my CDs and DVDs and my T-shirts and stuff, to have them there. And we had to walk to the stage from behind them because we put the stage, as you know, but I'll try to describe it to the listener. We, we we put the stage at the end of the field with the house where we were all changing in, the opposite end of the field. So to get to the stage, we literally had to walk what would have been a metaphorical aisle down the side of the auditorium onto the stage. Um Did you come on the Sunday or the Monday night? I was there both nights. You were but there both nights. Then both nights you would have seen... 
the very moving and emotional moment where we're just walking to the stage past the audience in view and everybody just stood up and gave us a standing ovation, the whole mm. band. And yeah, what can I tell you? It was, um, it was, it was an emotional moment. Getting back on stage feels like home. I feel comfortable on stage. I do feel very comfortable behind a piano. I feel comfortable behind a microphone singing. I wasn't nervous because of any of that, but I was just, I was very moved by the whole occasion. And Mattersea now has a new uh, Welcome to Mattersea sign. <laughs> Did you see my my post? We, we drove out, we turned left out of the house onto the Retford Road and we were driving and 100 yards down the road is a big, beautiful old fashioned sign and it was amy said oh we got to get a picture next to that and i said okay come on let's get a picture and when we took the picture and we looked at it i said oh look at the sign underneath it it says site of the of the prior 11 11 25 ad or something and that's when i went oh that's very funny we need to just you know pretend that the council are going to change that to site of the only billy joel songbook show 2020 ad you know so um, I, ha- I had a, I had a, a, a very lovely American friend who saw that on social media, Carol Wolf, one of my dear friends. And um, she wrote, <laughs> she's a, tra- a world traveler. And she wrote, I've put Mattersea on my bucket list of places to visit. So um, I thought that was very cute. <laughs> Pace, our special guest and a track from his album which is called A Seat at My Table. The track is The Glory Days. We'll be back with Elio after the break. Nova FM. It's a Tuesday morning in Newport. It's Harvey with you until one o'clock. My special guest today is Elio Pace. Before the break, he was telling us about that concert in Mattersea, the two concerts bank holiday weekend with 200 socially distanced spectators. I then asked Elio when his love of music began. I was four years old when I put my hands onto a piano keyboard for the first time. So my mum and dad are both Italian. They emigrated from Italy in the early sixties, just a year or two after they got married. Um, I think they landed here in 1962 and uh, I was born in 1968. So it was 1972 that my dad and, 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 and I should say my mum and dad are very, very musical. They grew up with, you know, I mean, Italians, you know, we grew up with music in the house and all my aunties and uncles and cousins and everybody sings in Italy. Everybody's has that thing. Certainly my family did. So it was just part of our family. And, and the story goes that my dad was told about a piano that was being sold at the local church they needed to get rid of. And he offered them five pounds for it. This is 1972. It was about a hundred pounds, you know, in today's money. And he's, uh, he took it off them. He took it back home. He stripped it down. It was all battered and out of tune and he stripped it down and painted it white. And, um, I think he got a tuner in to come and tune it. And the tuner said, this is sort of unsalvageable, sir. But what I, what I can do is I can tune it up enough you know, for, for you guys to play it. And I, he had, um, myself, a little four year old and my sister, um, Giuseppina was, uh, was there as well. She's 18 months younger than me. And, um, so, so the piano was tuned, but it wasn't up to concert pitch. So, you know, when you play a C, it wasn't actually a C playing. It was somewhere between a, maybe a B flat and a B or maybe even a B and, a, and somewhere in a C, but it was there and it made a sound and it was a beautiful sound you know, to me. And my dad who, who brought an accordion with him over from Italy, um, cause that was his instrument and a harmonica. Um, so all of a sudden now we had a piano and, and, uh, and apparently I took to it. I took to it like a, like a fish to water and I would sit there for hours and 
and not play with my games necessarily, but I would sit at the piano and plonk away and just dum, 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 dum. And then my dad would hold my finger and, and show me how to play a tune. I, apparently the first tune that he ever helped me play and that when eventually the stabilizers came off, shall we say, um, and he took his finger off my finger was Eviva España. Ding, 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 you know, like that. And that's, of course, you can play in C. It's all the white notes. And, and I would have marked the keys. I think I put stickers on them and I wrote, eventually I would have written, you know, when I was, you know, six, seven, eight or nine or whatever, I put, wrote the, the keys, D, C, E, F, G, you know, but that was my introduction. It was my mum and dad, really. My mum and dad who just spent their lives morning till night singing and bringing music to the house, cooking in the, I tell this story in, in the Elvis show, you know, I, you know, I grew up with them making pasta together and the ragu sauce, uh, you know, filling the house. It was delicious smells and these beautiful Italian Neapolitan songs coming from the kitchen that they used to sing together. And, and that was, um, that was my childhood. And, and can you remember your first ever public performance? I do. I absolutely do. I was. It was either four or five years old. I can actually visualize it right now. It was in a working man's club in Woking. So I, they, they emigrated and they moved to Adelston in Surrey. I was born in Woking and we lived in Adelston. Um, and it was somewhere around about 1972 or 73. You might be able to help me with this because the song I performed on stage with the band at that working man's club was power, power to all my friends. Oh, the Cliff, Cliff Richard, Richard song. Do you know it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What year was that? Oh, 72? I'm 70... going to guess 70, yeah, 72, 73, isn't it? Maybe yeah. it's no later than 73, certainly. Right. Well, that's, that's the very first song that I ever performed on stage in front of anybody, in front of the general public. And I can remember, I swear to you, I can remember doing it I can remember that the band, bless their hearts, who must have had a message from my dad. Uh, you want to get my, you want to get my son up, you know, to, you know, he he likes this song, and they obviously knew it enough to play it. But I, even at four or five years old, I can remember thinking they didn't get that quite right. <laughs> you know, they they didn't get that that chords wrong. I just knew that it wasn't like it sounded on the record, right? Arrogance at that age, but um. No, it was, I just, I just had this feel for music, obviously, and I had an ear for it. Cliff Richard and power to all our friends on Nova FM 97.5. Just so you know, Elio, it was 1973. Nova FM. Before the news, we were hearing from our special guest, Elio Pace, about his love of music and how it began when he was four years old. And he was singing Cliff Richard's Power to All Our Friends on stage in 1973. He's going to tell us now what happened after he came off stage and then he got his big break on Opportunity Knocks. I remember coming off that stage. Remember, I'm four or five, right? So I've spent the previous hour, you know, with mum and dad playing with the rest of the kids, running around like, crazy little kids do and i and and just and just having fun and i remember coming off the stage walking off stage left down the steps and i remember these kids swarming around me at a distance standing around me almost as if they'd acknowledged that all of a sudden this little kid had done something different something that they'd never seen before i remember that strange little moment and the confidence of feeling, wow, that felt good. And look at this reaction. I instantly felt different to how I'd felt four minutes earlier. And I can, I can remember that moment. It's really weird. And then going forward a few years, you, you appeared and I think you won a heat of opportunity knocks. That's right. 1988. 
Bob says opportunity knocks. Of course, I grew up with the Huey Green mm, version. Me too. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and we used to watch it every single week. We loved the program. So when, now, it was Bob Monkhouse really that led me to it because I adored Bob Monkhouse. He used to make me laugh as a kid so much. I used to find him so funny. The gags that I understood used to make me laugh. And he used to have a program called the Bob Monkhouse Show. It was a chat show. Do you remember? He had his own yeah. chat show with a big, huge orchestra there. And I used to love this variety program. He used to have comedians on and they would do their skits and there was music and and I loved it. So when in 1987, they announced they were bringing Opportunity Knox back and it was hosted by Bob Monkhouse. It was going to be called Bob Says Opportunity Knox. I said, ah. Oh. I have, I'd love to meet Bob and what a great opportunity. I could enter myself into this competition. Um, never really thinking much more about it. It really wasn't, I didn't, you know, it wasn't like a, some sort of, you know, career move. It was really was, I'd like to meet Bob Monkhouse. I'd love to meet this guy and I can sing. So, and I can play the piano. So why don't I, so what was that? 1980. Eight was when mm. I actually um, auditioned and 88, May the 14th, 1988 was my national television debut on Opportunity Knox. I was 20 years old. And what did you sing? I sang one of my own songs, a song that I'd written called Take You Home. I'd written it a couple of years earlier. I'd written it with Shaken Stevens in mind. I was a huge Shaken Stevens fan growing up. I used to love Shaken Stevens and the band and the piano solos and the horns and the orchestration and the, the sound of those records. I was so excited by This Old House and and Green Door and It's Raining and Lipstick Powder and Paint. I just adored it. So I wrote this song called Take You Home as a sort of boogie shuffle boogie number. Um, and... Uh, and I sent it off to Shaken Stevens, actually. And I even got a letter on cassette and I got a letter back from the, from the fan club or wherever it was or the management company saying, thank you for your cassette for take you home. And, um, um, we, we're going to pass on this, uh, but thank you very much for sending it. And that was it. You know, good luck. Um, two years later, I decided I would do it on opportunity knocks and it was the most thrilling thing. I mean, I mean, talk about being nervous. I mean, I was, it was, it was on, it was pre-recorded on the Thursday, but it put out on BBC One on a Saturday night. And there was the biggest orchestra I'd ever played with it with my song had been, um, orchestrated by the musical director. And we did the song and I did it in one take. Uh, I was so nervous. I started the song slightly too fast, but it's okay. We went with it and I won my heat. And they brought back the old clap, um, clapometer oh, yes. thing, you know, and the clapometer went right up to the maximum 99. Uh, and I won my heat, which meant you automatically returned the next week as a winner. And you were automatically placed in the final, which would ultimately be in the June of that year, 1988. Um, and it was live. That was live from uh, from Broadcasting House. And on the second week, I did another one of my songs called Pray. And then when I came to do the final live, I, they asked me if I would do Take You Home Again. And what's lovely, Harvey, is that I left that song to languish all those years. And when I made my very first and still to this date, my only album of all of my own material, I decided I would take Take You Home and I would finally, finally record it properly for my album a seat at my table and uh, so in 2009 when it was finally released that was the very first time I'd ever recorded it took me 21 years between Opportunity Knox and releasing my first album to record Take You Home properly Now I've spoken my mind and you know exactly how I feel Oh don't be shy now honey you know I got a heart for sale Can't you see it's in the stars the moon he says is right The twinkle in your eyes Set me light So come on baby let me Take you home Oh yeah I say sugar won't you let me Oh, you're killing me, baby. <laughs> Dead. 
down boy. Elio Pace from his album A Seat at My Table and Take You Home, the song that he won a heat on Opportunity Knocks with. It's Nova FM on a Tuesday morning. It's Harvey with you until one o'clock, and my special guest is Elio Pace. Next, we're going to talk about him touring with Shaking Stevens and then his collaborations with the great Albert Lee. I, in 2004, was asked to join his band. I played piano. I, I wrote some of the... Uh, some of the arrangements for him. I, I looked after the, the backing vocals after the great Tony Rivers and Anthony Thompson left the band. Uh, it fell to me to sort of look after the backing vocals. I played piano for him for two years, yeah, 2004 to 2006. In fact, I was part of, um, I recorded with him as well, um, his album Now Listen. I was on that. I played a part in that. And Albert Lee is somebody you talk about quite a lot. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> well, if you ever heard Albert Lee play, you know, it, it changes your well, life. Well, I know Albert hear... Lee's music, but I think for, for some of our listeners may not know him that well. So just just describe who, okay. who is Albert Lee to those that don't know. Albert Lee, British-born guitar player who made his name, really made his name in America in the early 70s when he joined Emmylou Harris's band and played guitar in her band. He also then went on to play with Eric Clapton. Well, actually, I'm, I, I may as well just stop the list, to be <laughs> honest, because we will be here for the next three hours. Albert Lee has actually played with, I would say, almost everybody, bar Elvis Presley. But, and he was one phone call away from playing with Elvis Presley because one of um, Albert's best mates is James Burton. And James Burton got ill one day during the 70s and thought that he wouldn't be able to make one of the Elvis Presley concerts. And uh, he put Albert on standby, but uh, James recovered. Mm. <laughs> so, um, but Albert Lee is uh, basically, you know, he played in Eric Clapton's band, Joe Cocker. Um, he's played with the Everly Brothers for over 20 years. He is regarded in the world as probably the greatest country picking uh, chicken picking, I think they call it, guitar player in the world. He's, um, he's an absolute god of the guitar. And in 2006, I had a phone call from the late Brian Hodgson, who only passed away this year. Um, dear, lovely man, bass player, who was the bass player in Albert Lee and Hogan's Heroes. Um, and, uh, he called me up. I'd met him on a Mike Berry gig that I once played. I, I did a show with Mike Berry in the early nineties called Tutti Fruity. We toured the country, became friends with Mike. And then Mike asked me to play piano for a few gigs. I met Brian, Brian Hodgson calls me up and says, listen, Pete Wingfield, the great Pete Wingfield is leaving Albert's band. And I want to put you forward. Are you interested? Harvey? I very nearly said no straight away. Right. Wow. I, 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 he said, listen, you've got a couple of weeks to think about it. And I, I really had to be talked into taking this gig because I was like, are you kidding me? I've heard what, I've heard what these gigs are like. I know what all of this music is like. It goes at a, a breakneck speed. And I'm, I'm more of a, you know, I'm, I'm not just a song man, but a sort of, you know, a bit of funky player. I don't think I can, I, I can't stand on stage and play a piano solo after or before Albert Lee. It's just, you know, this, I can't, this is, so I very nearly turned it down, but I, in the end I went, okay. So I looked at the material. I worked, I worked so hard on this for two weeks and I said, okay, I'll give it a go. I'll come and try out at the gig. And my first ever gig September 2006 with Albert Lee was at the Palace Theatre in Newark. And I turned up, no rehearsal. Um, I was there three hours early. <laughs> I got there. I set up my piano. I met the sound guy. I met a few other people involved. And then Albert Lee and the band turned up. They were very sweet, very nice to me. We'd already spoken a bit on the phone Okay. Yeah. How'd you feel? I said, no, I'm good. I've got my little crib sheet here on the floor, just little things to remind me what to do. And I've gone through the set and, you know, I'll do my best. I, I did the best I could. And in the interval, they offered me the job. Wow. And then going back to your album, uh, A Seat at My Table. Yes. Albert Lee is on a couple of the tracks on your album, isn't he? He really is. I mean, that was, 
And I'm so honoured to have the great Albert Lee play on one of my own songs. He, so he plays, in fact, he plays two of, on two songs. He plays on a song called Sober Siri. Um, does, and, and, and when I wrote this song in the early nineties, when I, I wrote it on a guitar in Norway, I was doing piano bars in Norway for a period of my life. And I wrote this song. Never in a million years, if somebody had said to me, you'll have Albert Lee playing guitar on this. Because that's who I was thinking. I was thinking this is like country picking, James Burton style, Albert Lee style. You know, and I loved Albert Lee's work on the Shaken Stevens records. He plays guitar on the uh, the couple of the very first Shaken Stevens albums produced by Stuart Coleman. They're phenomenal rock and roll records. Probably the best British rock and roll records ever made, in my in my opinion. Um And Albert Lee plays on that. So I was fully aware when I got this call who, you know, uh, how important Albert Lee was to popular music. The fact that he then ended up becoming a a dear, dear, dear friend of mine, still is. And uh, we travelled around the world together. And then he ended up playing on my album, Sober Siri, and another song called Lazy Days is one of the greatest accolades of my life. Siri came around to the club. We said I could buy Elio Pace from his album A Seat at My Table featuring the great Albert Lee on guitar and that track is called Sober Siri. We've got one more little bit of Elio to play before the news at 11 o'clock. After the news he'll be back with us and we'll talk about Terry Wogan, we'll talk about Billy Joel, we'll talk about Elvis Presley and other things as well. But to take us to the news I asked Elio any plans for some new music? There's always been plans for a new album because as much as I love performing other people's songs the joy of performing my music to a room full of people who have come to see me do exactly that is second to nothing that is one of the most incredible feelings of hearing my music ringing out and people tapping that and watching even some people sing along i mean that's you see i'm not signed i'm not part of some major corporate wheel I'm, I'm an independent artist like like thousands if not millions of other artists like myself i got close to to being um signed but you know the, the, being signed well actually i was signed i actually did have a record deal offered to me during the weekend wogan years um with warner uh that fell through unfortunately before they even released anything but i'm just a statistic in this um in this world of popular music you know but um no, playing my own material has been amazing. Filling, you know, selling out Ronnie Scott's uh, was was incredible. Touring with my band, playing my own material was amazing. Having my songs covered was incredible as well. I've had one of my songs on my album called Oh So Tight was picked up by a Swedish band who recorded their version of it, put it on an album. The album went top 10 in Sweden. <laughs> so that's a massive accolade. Um, hearing... My Christmas song, What a Day, on national radio uh, was an amazing feeling. Having it playlisted by Radio 2 was an amazing feeling. Hearing it not only on Terry Wogan's show, but on Steve Wright in the afternoon, you know, it's like that's quite quite a feeling. Um, 
So that's one. Writing a song for Albert Lee for his album Like This, which I produced. I produced the album. Uh, he asked me to do it. We wrote a song myself and Matt Daniel Baker. We sat down. We wrote a song called Can Your Grandpa Rock and Roll Like This, which was written specifically for Albert and he loved it and recorded it. So, yeah, there are plans, Harvey. I've, I've always got plans, but life gets in the way. Mm. Um, when you're an independent artist, uh Unless you have the money behind you for the advertising, unless unless you get lucky in some way, it's very, very difficult to earn a proper living from singing your own material. So I've had to do other things. Um, it wasn't the reason I put the Billy Joel songbook together, but it's, you know, I, I, I knew that if I could make this a popular show... I needed to earn some money. That's why I did musical theatre for a bit. That's why I musically directed shows for Bill Kenwright and stuff like that. So life gets in the way because I want to earn a living as a musician. And um, But what I would ultimately, ultimately love to be able to do is to tour anywhere and have rooms full of people that have come to hear me perform my own material. special guest today is Elio Pace and that's a track from his album A Seat at My Table called Addicted to the Phone One thing Elio and I have got in common, well we've got a few things in common we both love Billy Joel, we both love music and our careers have both crossed with the uh, the great Sir Terry Wogan. Elio's in a much more significant way than mine did um, I'm going to let him tell you all about it uh, He was on Weekend Wogan 35 shows as the house band Every single week three songs a show for 35 shows. It's a, it's a record, apparently. No one ever in the history of, of live national radio in this country has ever performed so much in one year. How did it come about? Two words. Terry Wogan. He changed my life. In Just after I did Opportunity Knocks in 1988, um, we had a phone call. Uh, the agency that I'd been signed up to had a phone call uh, saying, we've got you a slot on Wogan, the chat show that came out live from the Shepherd's Bush Empire, Mondays, Wednesdays and Friday nights, half hour show. Um, probably the most popular at the time, you think, Harvey, of, of chat oh, shows? Without a doubt. Yeah. So to get a slot on that was unbelievable. Again, I'm good with dates. It was August the 8th, 1988, that I appeared on the Wogan show, the Wogan chat show. Um, with with her. Very briefly. <laughs> All right, steady. <laughs> yes. I uh, I had hair, I was slender, and um and I put together a little uh, a little medley of Don't Get Around Much Anymore, One Night with You, the Elvis song, and uh, Flip Flop and Fly. And I closed the show. I got to say a quick hello to Terry before the show started, a quick goodbye to Terry after the show had uh, gone off air. It was live. Uh, live telly. Wow. Mm. BBC one. And, um, he was very sweet. He said, he was very kind to my mum and dad, uh, very quickly, you know, a few minutes said hello to everybody. And then he went and that was it. Then about 15 years later, I am getting on with my career as a gigging musician. And I employ a young lady called Sue Acterson to come and, uh, Depp, deputize for one of my regular singers, uh, Helen York. Now, Helen had given me Sue's number and said, try Sue. She, you know, she's, she's a great singer and uh, maybe she can do the gig. I'm sorry, I can't do the gig. So I called Sue. Um, she could do the gig. She came and did the gig. We became friends and she came and did a couple of, it was a few gigs down the line until she popped into the conversation that uh, she'd just started dating um, Terry Wogan's son, Mark. 
And I was like, oh, wow, are you? That's really. And that's when I told her about my little history with Terry mm. Wogan from 15 years earlier. And she said, oh, I'll tell Terry that I did a gig with you. I said, oh, please send my love to Terry. He was so lovely and, and uh, so, so supportive and, and really kind. Anyway, the message came back. Terry remembers you. He sends his best. And that was lovely. And then the next thing I know is that Sue and Mark ask me if I, with my band, which she wouldn't be part of for this event, would play at their wedding mm. in France at Terry's house, Terry and his wife Helen's house. I said, I'd love to play at your wedding and I'd love to see Terry again. So that's when I saw Terry Wogan again, 15 years later. This time, most of my hair had gone and uh, <laughs> I'm surprised he even recognized me. But again, charming as anything, really delightful. And um, I was there and we did a lovely job of the wedding, of playing the band. And, and Sue got up to sing a song and uh, it was a wonderful, beautiful night. Uh, playing outdoors and uh, it was just fantastic next thing i know i'm i'm with neil fairclough and uh, his wife davina neil who's my bass player who you've just seen playing at mattacy with me uh, uh who now plays mm. with queen he i was at his house in manchester and i woke up uh one morning and the phone my phone I switched it on and it was it lit up and it was all these people saying, we heard you on the radio this morning. Now, this is two weeks after that wedding. So this is round about August, hmm, August, August 9th, something maybe, uh, 2003. And we've heard you on the radio this morning. Terry Wogan played you on, on national radio this morning. I was like, what, what? What has he played? I've only got a demo CD of me doing covers called Come and Get It, which... Which at this point, Harvey, I didn't even have a website. The CD was literally a demo of my band, albeit a really polished, great demo of my band, playing 13 or 14 covers. And uh, there, there was no barcode on there. There was, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't for public sale. But someone at the wedding must have given him my album, this album. Two weeks later, he played a song on the end of that album, which was an afterthought, a song by Delbert McClinton called Two More Bottles of Wine, which I recorded just piano, vocal and Darren Loveday on guitar. And we put this, I decided just to fill the CD up with, with, uh, with two more bottles of wine. So he picked this song out. He must have got special dispensation from the bosses at Radio 2 to play this completely unknown artist on national radio on his breakfast show. Not just once, he ended up playing two more bottles of wine every single week <laughs> on his national radio show, which was the most listened to radio show in Europe for six months. And he completely changed my life by doing that now you know i didn't become a superstar but what happened was all of a sudden i had the accolade of being on national radio every week you could count on it he didn't i had no communication with terry during this time there was no quick little message hi elio um, it's going down really well and you know i'm going to play it again next wednesday nothing he kept his distance in fact the next time i saw Terry was at another corporate gig when he was there and he was dancing with his wife and he just extended his hand for a quick handshake mid chorus of something and then moved away into the dance floor. That was the last time I saw him. I mean, what he did for me. And then when my Christmas single was made, what a day he, he took that and made it his Christmas song of the year. And uh, again, just completely, completely opened up huge doors for me the, the the guy was amazing and then in 2009 a month before my daughter was born marcella in the june of 2009 i got a phone call from mark wogan saying um you can't tell anybody this but uh, Ray, uh dad's leaving the breakfast show in december of 2009 and the bbc are giving him a new show on a sunday it's called weekend wogan and dad and us, we want you to be the house band. 
It's not straightforward, he said, because um, the BBC have their favourites and they will want this, this other band to be the house band. But Dad has made it very clear that he will do the show when you are the house band. That's, that's an <laughs> amazing story. And that's the absolute truth. The details of which, Harvey, I will save for my book. I, but I, let's park that one we, there, we, shall we? We will talk again when you publish your book then. <laughs> one day. But you mentioned Neil Fairclough, yeah. your bass player. And yes. Brian May was one of the people that came and played with your band on Weekend Wogan. That's right. What song did you sing? And tell us what happened after that gig as far as your bass player, Neil Fairclough, was, was concerned. Let me just backtrack one second. Neil Fairclough I met in about 1993. I went to college with his sister, Sue, at Leeds College of Music, and she would talk about her brother. You'd love my brother. You've got to meet my brother. You've got to meet my brother. What does your brother do? He's a bass player. Is, is he at college? Well, you know, he's, he's sort of, he goes to a college near Manchester. Okay, well, one day I'll meet your brother. I look forward to it. You'll love my brother. She kept just saying, you'll love my brother. If ever a sentence ever was so true, was that one. Neil Fairclough is one of the most extraordinary musicians and people that anyone who's ever met him has ever met. Um, he's 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 a f phenomenon. And we became friends in 1993. I got him down from Manchester. He, I, I booked his train fare. He came down with his with his uh, fretless bass and played uh, bass on a demo I was making of one of my songs, Holding You. And uh, I was blown away by his preparation, by the way he played this thing. And we became friends. And when I put my uh, band together, first time I ever decided, you know what, I want my own band. As much as I love turning up to these cabaret gigs and with my charts and meeting the musicians on the stand and playing my shows opening for Ronnie Corbett or opening for Michael Barrymore or or whoever it was, um, I I said, I'm going to put my band together. And, uh, and he joined my band in 1996 and has been in my band first call since then. So um, when we got to Weekend Wogan, and, and we played all gigs, all sorts of gigs up to this point, weddings, corporates, you know, gigs where they put the band in the wrong room, the bars in the other room, we're in this room. And so we're playing to literally two kids dancing, you know, and we've got to do three 45 minute sets and nobody is interested. That's when you need a Neil Fairclough in the band because people like Neil know how to lift your spirits and and how to keep it all going. And uh, he's a joy to be around. So we got this lovely break, thanks to Terry Wogan and Mark Wogan. And uh, when I met Neil, one of the first things that comes out of his mouth is what a huge Queen fan he is. And one of the first things that comes out of my mouth is what a huge Billy Joel fan I am. And he went, oh, I love Billy Joel. And I said, oh, I love Queen. And, you know, so this guy, so we, we he's Queen. I'm Billy Joel. He he absolutely loves it as much as I love Billy. We're doing the Weekend Wogan show. The producer, lovely Alan Boyd, calls me in the middle of the year. We've just done, we've done, you know, I don't know, 20 shows or so. And he says, um, we've got Brian May coming on um, in a couple of weeks' time. And he's coming with Kerry Ellis, who uh, is going to be singing a few songs from her album. And... Um, and, and Brian's coming along just to oversee the rehearsal. And he's, he'll probably do a little bit of the interview with Kerry. And I said, you mean he's not bringing a guitar? He said, I don't think he, I think, I think he's happy for the band to play. I said, what? you can't have Brian May on the show, Alan. We, we've got to get him to bring his guitar. He said, well, and he literally said, well, look, he's asked for your phone number. He wants to talk through because I was the musical director of this show. Not only the featured artist, three songs a show, but also in charge of looking after the music and writing the arrangements with my assistant MD, Adrian Fry, who was the trombone player in the band. He said, he's got your number. He's going to give you a call. You talk to him. So I did. And we had a lovely chat. Brian, you know, when you, you know, when you sort mm. of get to meet your heroes, you know, the, the people that you see on telly and you go, are these guys just putting it on, you know? Uh, well, from what I can see, Brian May is not putting it on. He's a he's a charming, delightful, humble, brilliant, intelligent man. And um, he was lovely to us. And uh, I got him to bring his guitar. I said, I said, you've got to bring your guitar. You've got to bring your guitar. I said, can't you come and, you know, play along with Kerry's songs? He said, you know, he said, oh, OK, well, you know, I, I, I didn't really want to step on the toes of, of your guitar player. I said, believe me. 
I think he'll be pretty flattered mm. to be sharing a band with you, to be in the band with you, Brian. Bring your guitar, please. Okay, I'll bring it. And I said, apart from anything else, my bass player, Neil, who, who you know, in 2000, so yeah. Yeah, what's that, 14 years later, I said, I said, my bass player is your biggest fan. I mean, he's the biggest Queen fan. He said, oh, you know, well, I'm, okay, well, I'll bring it along. So I had the joy of calling Neil and going, mate, I've just spoken to Brian May and Brian May's coming on the Weekend Wogan show. And he, I won't do uh, his Lancashire accent because it'll just embarrass me, but he was, no way. I said, yes, way. Yes. So Neil was beside himself. Now there's a, there's a reason to give you all that backstory and you know what the, what the ending is and I've already given it away, but Brian came, did the show. Kerry was phenomenal. Brian was phenomenal. And, um, I got to sing, I, I, I had these three songs and one of the songs I'd chosen by pure coincidence was Give Me Some Loving, uh, the Spencer Davis group song, which apparently Neil told me uh, afterwards, he said, you know that Queen did a version of that live. I said, I had no idea. Well, it caught the ear of of Brian as he was walking out after the rehearsal. He literally put his guitar, his, his roadie had put his guitar away. He'd said goodbye. Thanks guys. We'll see you tomorrow at the show. Looking forward to it. He was on his way out of the, uh, halfway up the aisle saying goodbye to Alan Boyd. I kicked into my rehearsal for Give Me Some Loving. Um, Brian turned around. He walked back onto the stage. The roadie took the guitar out. Steve Price, his roadie on that day, took the, the guitar out of the case, put it around his neck, plugged it back in, and Brian started playing along with us at the, at the rehearsal on the Saturday. And at the end of the rehearsal, I'm blown away, right, because Brian has just come back to jam with us. And Brian was the one that said, can I join you? Yeah. And we were like, well, let's, yeah, let's have a think about that. What do you think? Um, and that's how that came about. And so the next morning, live on National Radio 2, at the few minutes past 11 o'clock, I started Give Me Some Lovin' and Brian May featured on lead guitar. He's going to perform now as a special treat with the Elio Pace house band. Ladies and gentlemen, with Elio, Brian May. <laughs> Pace, Brian May with Neil Fairclough on bass guitar. We'll find out what happens next after the break. Sean best music mix. Nova FM. Before the break, we heard Elio's band performing with the great Brian May from Queen. After that, a fairy tale for Elio's bass player. I'll let Elio tell you about it. What happened afterwards was that um, we were all on a high. Brian was delighted with the way the live transmission had gone. And so was Kerry. I get called to Brian and Kerry's dressing room about, this is about an, half an hour after the audience have left. Half, most everybody's gone by this point. I'm still, I'm always the last to leave, Harvey, by the way. I'm always the last to leave a show. 
And Brian, obviously, is a bit like me. And he, I, I got a message. Brian would like to have a quick word with you in the dressing room. I went to the dressing room. Him and Kerry were sitting there. It was just us three in the room. He said, Elio, we're both blown away by the quality and the calibre of your band. We are, we've are. we been asked to do Proms in the Park, Hyde Park, in a couple of weeks' time. Kerry's being featured. I'm playing with... The, we're going to do this with the BBC Concert Orchestra. And we need to fill a few spaces in the band that we're building to play with Kerry. And we'd like to use you on the piano and Neil on the bass and your three girl backing vocalists. I mean, you could still probably hear my jaw hitting the floor. Okay. Uh, t- with two weeks to go as well. But but I, I swear to you, my first thought was, I can't wait to get out of this building to call Neil Fairclough and tell Neil, who was on his way on a train by this point back to Manchester from the, from, from Regent Street. I couldn't wait to tell him. I came out of the, the room. I obviously said, yes, consider that a yes from everybody, Brian and Kerry. I went out of his room. I walked uh, 10 metres to the left into what was our, our communal room that we all used to dress in. And I walked in. This is now over an hour after the show has finished. By this point, there literally is nobody in the building but me and the caretaker. I walked into that room. Who was in the room? The four people I had the best news for. The three girls had hung around and Neil had hung around. Obviously because I just feel Neil just needed to savour the moment that he'd just performed with Brian May an hour earlier. I sat them down. I went, Neil, I can't believe you're here. Girls, I've got some news for you. And I told them what the news was. And you don't need me to tell you what the reaction was in that room. And we went on to do that show at Hyde Park in in early September. Um, And from that moment, Brian, well, Brian then offered us all a tour with Kerry Ellis in the 2011, in I think it was May 2011. I decided not to do that tour. Because I really, really, really wanted to get back to doing my own thing. You know, my my uh, contract with Warners had fallen through. The Wogan show had fallen through. And I just really wanted to get back on the road and perform my material again. And I just felt if I sort of, you know, you know spread myself too thinly, I wouldn't be doing any of it the proper service. So I said no. But Neil said yes. And he went on tour with Kerry and Brian, and that's when Brian offered Neil the permanent chair in the newly reformed Queen, Adam Lambert and Queen Band. And to this day, Neil is still playing bass for Adam Lambert and Queen around the world. And that, to me, is the most perfect and beautiful fairy tale ending for my mate, Neil Fairclough. No for FM. My special guest today is Elio Pace, singer, songwriter, piano player. The first time I saw Elio's band live was when they performed the Billy Joel songbook. That's going back about four or five years now. I saw them play in Liverpool for the first time. So let's find out how the Billy Joel songbook came about. I fell in love with Billy Joel back in the in the middle of the 1980s. I can't me going on about how good I am with dates. I cannot remember when this happened, but it was sometime after I'd finished uh, secondary school and started, and I was at college at, at uh, down there in Eastleigh in Hampshire where I was brought up. So I must have been 16 or 17 years old at sixth form college. And um, I'd just broken up with a girl, my first girlfriend. And uh, I wanted to... I wanted to learn this song by this guy called Billy Joel or Billy Joel. I, I, I literally, to me, he was just a name. He had a funny surname that I'd never heard anywhere else before. And uh, and he sang this song called My Life, which I used to love when it came on the radio. That's all I knew about this guy. I hadn't made a beeline to buy it. I, I, I you know, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't as easy in those days just to look somebody up, you know, Um So I wanted to learn this song because I had a new gig up in Chandler's Ford in a local pub where I would play Fridays and Saturday nights with my Fender Rhodes piano and two little speakers on stands. 
and I wanted to learn my life to add it to my to my repertoire. And I remembered that uh, Katie Stevens, her name was my ex-girlfriend, um, her parents had this song on a cassette. And so I made up this excuse to go around to see her that I wanted to borrow the cassette because I wanted to see if I could charm the pants off her again and see if she'd forgive me. And we could, you know, I was 16, 17. Um, she gave me the wrong tape at the front door, shut the door as soon as she could. I got back on my bike and she'd given me the Innocent Man album. And I didn't notice this until I was on my way home. So humiliated, I decided to carry on home and not go back and swap it for the, the cassette with my life. And I went home and that night I fell in love with Billy Joel by accident. Um, and it was the song This Night that turned my life around. There was something in that song that I had never heard a rock star do on radio, on records I owned. And I was a big Elvis Presley fan at that time. I told you I was already into Shaking Stevens. And this Innocent Man album is a retro album, as you know. You know, it's it's a look back to his youth. So there's songs that sound like Frankie Valli on there, The Temptations, The, mm. the Drifters, James Brown. And then there was this song, This Night, and it was the way that this guy, Billy Joel, sang this song. And this one particular line in that last chorus, tomorrow is such a long time away with that little twiddle at the end of the of the line. And the, the way he reached those notes, the, 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 the knowledge in his singing, it absolutely, it just knocked me out. And that's when I went, who is this guy? He's written everything, words and music by Billy Joel. And he looks a dude. He sounds like a dude. The music is, is, is so varied. He's covered this genre incredibly well, like the best I'd ever really heard it done. Um, modern production. I just, I couldn't get enough. And the next day, I remember going to college the next day and I started asking my friends, um, do you know Billy Joel? Have you got any Billy Joel? Did you, do you have any Billy well, I don't have any Billy Joel. My dad has got some Billy Joel. I said, oh, can I, do you think I could borrow some of his records? And so I spent the next few days and weeks finding Billy Joel's records. I mean, you know, I, I didn't have enough money to go down to the shop and spend 250 quid on records in those days, you know, um, and, and get the, the entire collection. So I borrowed these these records and I put them onto tape and I wore those tapes out, you know, loving this this music, listening to nothing, nothing else for months, months, if not a year at least. And I fell in love with this music and I discovered all this new stuff. Now, where were we? This is sort of mid-80s. Mid so um, I don't think The Bridge had even come out at this point. No, because Innocent sure. Man was 83, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Um, so The Bridge the was bridge probably about was 86, was it? Yes, it was. So it's it's either that the bridge had come out and I completely missed it, right? But certainly Stormfront hadn't come out, 1989, and The River of Dreams, the last um, pop album he's made, 93. But up to that point, I managed to find everything. Cold Spring Harbor, Piano Man, Street Life Serenade, Turnstiles, 52nd Street, The Stranger, Glass Houses, uh, Songs in the Attic, The Nylon Curtain, and an innocent man. And I devoured this music, devoured it. I did not, I sat at the piano nonstop trying to work out and learn all these new chords. And I learned to write songs because of Billy Joel and, and I fell in love with it. So it was there. I instantly, I remember thinking, ah, oh, God, I wish I could go back to college right now and, and sing these songs and put a band together to do these songs. And at every single corporate or wedding I ever played, I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to do a whole evening of Billy Joel, but I knew that wouldn't go down well. You know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta spread the love a bit and do all the big popular hits that people want to hear. A bit of Stevie Wonder, a bit of Van Morrison, mm. a bit of Elvis, a bit of all that. But deep in my heart, I was like, oh, Oh, I want to sing, say goodbye to Hollywood. Oh, I want to do Good Night Saigon. Oh, I want to do. And of course, when The River of Dreams came out, I was like, this would go great at a wedding. And it was a big hit. You know, an uptown girl went well and my life went well. So I would put in as much Billy Joel as I could. as like without being told, hey, mate, can you play something else now? You know, and then it was probably around about mid 90s. I, I had a conversation with a producer who was producing the aforementioned Tutti Frutti, which I toured with Mike Berry. 
Now, everybody knows that Elio's like gone berserk about Billy Joel. I mean, all my friends, all my family, they know that I, all I do is talk about Billy Joel and how great he is. And I've spent years and years doing this. So I had a conversation with this producer called David Graham. And I said, David, I'd, I, you know, do you think we could put a show on? He said, I don't see why not. I said, I mean, nobody else is doing it. No one else is doing this show. And um, we looked into it and... Uh, he, he was kind enough to let me have his office for a few weeks. We created a flyer. I think we just called it The Billy Joel Show, you know, with, starring Elio Pace and his mm. band, The Billy Joel Show. Um, we've got a little flyer together. We sent it out to 250 theatres in the country. I think they were mid-90s. And we had six people come back, say, oh, yeah, okay, that sounds quite interesting. Um, um, there was one theatre, I won't name them because it was rather embarrassing, there was one theatre that actually thought that it was the real Billy Joel that we were trying to sell into a 300 seater. <laughs> right. So you can see how tough this was a sell, right. But with only, and of course, as soon as they found out, no, it, no, sorry, we're not talking about the real Billy Joel. It's, it's a guy saying, Oh no, we're not interested. So now I had five theaters that were interested and that you can't put a tour on and put all the money into putting the thing on mm. with five shows. It's, it just wasn't worth it. So that was that. I also approached uh, a very big agent, uh, international artists, um, Laurie Mansfield. I took him my idea. This with the, the idea had developed a little bit, and um, I might have got this round the wrong way. I may have actually gone to Laurie Mansfield first, but Laurie Mansfield said, "Elio, this is a." And, and now I knew Laurie Mansfield because of my association with Ronnie Corbett. Laurie Mansfield uh, managed Ronnie Corbett, and. Um, he said, this is a great, great idea. He said, no one's doing it. You're right. He said, in my view, he said, because Billy is still touring, I think the River of Dreams album had just come out. So yes, it was before the David Graham attempt. So this was the first attempt. He said, he said, in my honest opinion, he said, Billy's still too current and you will struggle selling this show. He said, I think you're 20 years too early. So I, I, so, you know, so, so then we tried again a few years later and he was right. Uh, Laurie was absolutely on the button because almost to the year, 20 years later, I went, I've got to give this another go. I've got to give this another go. By this point, I decided it was going to be called the Billy Joel mm -hmm. songbook. And, um, I sat down, I found an agent called Barry Collings entertainments. And he said, yeah, okay. Now, now we're talking 2013 so yeah it was ex it was 20 years yeah. to the day that i spoke to laurie mansfield about it he was right 20 years too early i said to um i said to barry i said i've got this show billy joel songbook no one else is doing billy joel's music you can't find a tour in this country you'd be hard pressed finding a tour anywhere in the world of anyone traveling a nation singing billy joel songs why i don't know I said, I really believe I can do this. I've wanted to do this as long as I've ever fell in love with him when I was a kid. And he and Barry said, okay, let me give it a go. Let me punt it. Within a month, he had booked me a 70-date tour in 2014. And the rest, quite frankly, is history, Harvey. Um, so that was the first ever Billy Joel songbook tour and I'm very, very proud of where we stand right now. This
Elio Pace with his version of the Billy Joel song This Night from the album An Innocent Man and as Elio explained that was the song that got him hooked on Billy Joel. So we've heard about the Billy Joel songbook. A couple of years ago they did an extra tour uh, they've done it twice now, an albums tour with a very special guest. A very, very special guest. David Brown was my special guest in the band. David Brown was Billy Joel's lead guitar player from 1978 until 1991. The Billy Joel songbook had become so popular. Um, we were now, and I've got to say that first year, Harvey, I threw my money at this. This was my money that I threw at this. And I lost a lot of money that year because it, it's, it sort of felt like the, the, the public at large still were not quite ready for this new thing. Billy Joel, by this point, had told the world he'd had enough, right? He'd, he'd, he'd taken himself off the circuit. He hasn't made any more records, no albums. He pops up here, does a concert there he doesn't do any advertising for it they sell out and he goes back and and stuff so we we struggled to get people through the door i've got to be really honest you know we played sometimes on that first tour i was playing i think the lowest audience count was 35 people i think it was either grimsby or in chesham but you know and and when we when we hit 55 people we were like oh wow well, we've got well, okay okay we've got 55 people here that's brilliant when i hit over 100 you know the champagne was flowing you know by the by the by the beginning of that by the end of that 70 date tour and and believe me in the middle of that year my friends my band the people closest to me were saying listen mate you don't have to keep going with this. We know you're hemorrhaging money. I said, no, I have to keep going with this. I have to keep going with this. I've wanted to do this all my life. I think it's just a matter of time. People just, I can't afford two and a half thousand pound advertising for every single show. I can't put an advert on the side of a bus. I can't put it in the bus shelter. I can't put an advert in the national paper, you know, a full page advert in a national paper, £65,000 for one day. I said, that's why the big boys can sell tickets. I can't do that. But I honestly believe you've seen the reaction of the audience. Look at look at this. And of course, those 55 people were ecstatic at the end of the night. Those 120 people were ecstatic by the end of the night because the show is good, because the band are phenomenal and because the music is in my view, the greatest rock and roll songbook ever. So they were reacting to this thing and I just felt it was worth going. But I was encouraged to quit it at about 22 shows in. I said, no, I'm going. I don't care. Look, do you know what? I've worked all my life. I've built up a bit of savings and I'm going to throw it all at it. I could have bought a house, Harvey. I decided to throw it at, you know, I could have bought myself a very nice car. I didn't. I wanted to do this and it paid off. By the beginning of the second tour, we were starting to sell out shows before the tour even started. By the beginning of the third tour, half of our shows were already sold out and then we won an award. So, you know, the story, you know, it's it's quite something. And the, the show became so popular and we started getting this wonderful group of diehard Billy Joel fans who are as starved of Billy's incredible music as I was, who now come all the time. They come all the time and they don't they don't care about hearing the same stories. I tried to change a few of the songs up here and there, but it's a hits show. It's it's designed to to so that if, if you come as sort of half a music fan or half a Billy Joel fan, you may go home going, oh wow, I didn't realise he wrote all those incredible songs and I forgot that She's Always a Woman was a Billy Joel song. I didn't even know New York State of Mind was a Billy Joel. I've had so many people say well, the things number like of people that. that think that just the way you are is a Barry White song yeah exactly just exactly so and 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 his and Billy Joel's story is an amazing story and and I I love telling it and 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 so what happened was was that in the end I went oh these these guys that keep following us around there they're amazing I love these people you know they're wearing my t-shirts in the front row they're buying into this and I've and, and I thought I've got to start thinking about 
you know, putting some new songs into the show. But every time I kept doing it, I went, yeah, but if I do that, we're going to be here for five hours a night. And and that's not allowed in theatres, you know. It's just not allowed. Ken Dodd used to do it and he used to get away. He, he, well, he didn't mind. He would pay the charges because if you go over a certain curfew time in theatres, you're charged, mm. you know, by the 15 minutes and it, it can clock up, especially if you're playing in huge places. Anyway, I said, well, and I can't do a show and I can't exchange down Easter Alexa for the longest time. I can't exchange Rosalinda's eyes for Allentown. I've got to do these hits. I've got to do, you know, we didn't start the fire and I've got to do scenes from Italian restaurant and I want to. So I thought, and all of a sudden I had an epiphany. <laughs> it wasn't a great epiphany. I mean, he was staring me in the face. It was, why don't you start to do the albums? Why don't you do one off album tours Little little tours, because this is, I mean, if you think that selling Billy Joel was tough, selling Billy Joel albums was even tougher. Mm. But I thought, okay, we don't do 70 date tours. Let's do little 10 date tours, you know. I've got to say, Harvey, you know, if I was in love with Elton John as much as I am with Billy Joel's music, selling Elton John, certainly in Britain, would have been so much easier. So much easier. Because Elton is current, because Elton is still there, he's still in the news, he's still putting out music, you know. But anyway, we decided to go with the albums and I decided, and and then the, the, the best epiphany happened when I went, oh, David Brown, David Brown. David Brown had contacted me on Facebook. He contacted me mm. and he said, hey man, really like what you're doing. He says, I like, I like your spin on the Billy stuff. You're doing, you're doing a real, you know, a good service of, to it. Uh, you know, I hope one day we, our paths might cross and maybe we can play together. I mean, when I got that message, can you imagine Harvey, how I felt, right? This is a guy who is part of the iconic world of Billy Joel and was so instrumental and so much of he's a phenomenal guitar player. I mean, this he wasn't he wasn't Billy's guitar player by accident. This guy, I actually in my in my heart of hearts truly believe he's the greatest musician that Billy has ever had in any of his bands. He's just a proper artist. David Brown is a true artist and so talented. Good singer, good songwriter, an amazing textural guitar player. I mean, he's just he's he's out there. So then I thought, oh my word. I wonder if David would like to come over and play the whole of Glass Houses and the whole of An Innocent Man, because these were the two albums that I thought we should kick off with. I told him about the idea and he said yes. And in May 2018, we did the first Billy Joel albums show um, and it was a huge success. Last year, we did the second with Stormfront and The Stranger, again with David Brown. And it was at that point that David, sort of with under pressure, <laughs> it may be, agreed that maybe we should finish the set and he would love to be part of it. Well, the sad part of the story is that we had another albums tour lined up for October, this October, next month. And um, we've obviously had to cancel that. We have another one lined up for early next year, but... We we don't know, you know, who knows if it's going to go on. So, but that's how and that came any about. Any clues as to which albums that might be next year? I can't tell you. Don't let me do that, <laughs> Harvey. <laughs> um, we've done, so Billy made 12 albums, as you know. He made 12 studio albums. We've done four. Um, so there's eight more to go. Um, you can't go wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the albums are. No, not, does not, it? Certainly not does to it? me. It doesn't matter what they are. No, and, and not for hundreds, if not thousands of other people. It's, you know, every single song has something about it. doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It has a stroke of genius within it somewhere. So, um, well, I, I won't tell you what it is because I think the surprise is, is nice, but it, it really doesn't matter what album it's going to be. It's going to be phenomenal. Elio Pace, our guest today, is a singer. He's a songwriter and he's a piano player. He tours the country doing a Billy Joel songbook. A DVD was produced of that concert, uh, one of the early concerts. I think the recording was done back in 2015, but the, uh, the DVD was released in 2018. 
If you're interested in getting a copy, you can go and check out Elio's website. It's eliopace.com, E-L-I-O Pace, P-A-C-E dot com. And the big news about this DVD, it won an award. It certainly did, Harvey, to still, I'm still blown away by that accolade. I've been in this business, well, I count my television appearance on Opportunity Knocks on the 14th of May, 1988, as even though I'd been playing lots of gigs before that, but I'd sort of say that that's the day my musical career started. And in that time, I've never won anything. I've never been given an award for anything. I'm not saying I deserve an award, but I've just have never been in a position to have an award. You know, I mean, to be honest, a lot of what I do isn't very easily categorized. You know, my seat at my table is a little bit of a mishmash of styles, but who do I get that from? The great Billy Joel, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that. So I've never been a rock and roll artist or a country artist or a, or a rhythm and blues artist or a jazz artist. I've, I've dabbled in all of it. So, you know, I couldn't really put a seat at my table up for an award because what is it? It's, there is, there is, there's no award for a potpourri album like that. But anyway, um, yes, last year, uh, the Billy Joel songbook, the DVD of the show, which we recorded in November 2015 at the Stables in Wavingdon, one of the most fantastic venues in the country. Um, we finally put it to market in the April of 2018, a month before that first albums tour with David. Um, it was a huge critical success with the fans, with the press. And last year, June, 2019 it won an award for best long form video at the 17th annual independent music awards get this in new york so talk about shipping coals to newcastle it, it took it took the americans to to recognize the value of that dvd i'm extremely proud of it i knew it was great already um the people involved in making it tony draper who mixed the sound and nick watson who mastered it and uh, and steve tottingham who directed the movie and russell stainton who edited the movie together some of the best people in this business and again i spent enough money on making that that i could have I could have put a deposit down on a house you know but it was worth it and it was worth it for hearing my name called out in that theater in New York on Broadway. Uh, and the winner of the best long form video is, <laughs> he actually said, Elio Pace. But you know what? I'll take it. It was one of the most exciting moments of my life. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my pace and his version of Billy Joel's My Life. Elio mentioned earlier in the programme that this night from the Innocent Man album was the one that got him hooked on uh, Billy Joel. The one that got me hooked was that track. I heard it on the radio. I then bought the 52nd Street album and just like Elio I fell in love with Billy Joel. After the advert break, Elio will be back with us again and this time we're going to be talking Elvis Presley. This, this, before the break, Elio was telling us how he won an award for his DVD of the Billy Joel songbook. A couple of years later, he nearly won another award. We were nominated for uh, the exact same category, Best Long Form Video, for my show, which we called Elio Pace Presents Elvis Presley. So 2017 was the 40th anniversary, August the 16th. 2017, the 40th anniversary of the passing of Elvis Presley. I was nine years old when he died. And I remember that day like it was yesterday too. I remember exactly where I was. And I fell in love with Elvis Presley's music then. 
and have been a massive fan. And at the beginning of 2017, I thought, oh, wow, this is, the, I think I, I read something in the paper about this year being the 40th anniversary. And I was like, oh man, I've got to do something for that. What can I do with that? And my initial thought was, well, do you know what? You know what? I'm, I'm busy enough as it is with the Billy Joel songbook and, and stuff and other bits and pieces that I'm doing. I, maybe I'll just do a little concert, a little me at the piano and just find a little, I don't know, pizza on the park or something or a little, it's a little restaurant that I can just, you know, invite 50 people and just do a little show where I can just sing some Elvis songs and we can all have a, a little toast to the great Elvis Presley. Well, that idea turned into. No, you can't do that, mate. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I don't want to do. What I don't want to do is I don't want, I, I, I don't want to just put a band together with a horn section and female backing vocalists and go out and do suspicious minds and in the ghetto and burning love exactly as I have done in the past at corporate weddings and, and, uh, and, and even on weekend Wogan. I said, I don't see the point in just doing exactly what all those other um elvis tributes do albeit they wear white jumpsuits which <laughs> is not going to look good on me harvey right <laughs> so i said i, I don't want to do that i don't want to just go out and, there's no point in that if i'm going I'm to do something as something artistic with it and i and i came up with this idea of well i thought to myself you know there's something there is something nice about just the piano but if i had a, just a little bit of rhythm just to help it along a little, just like, like, and you know, Elton John is famous for having gone to Russia back in the seventies with just Ray Cooper, him on the piano and Ray Cooper on the percussion. And of course he's singing popular, famous songs. And I thought, well, if I'm singing popular, famous songs, these are Elvis Presley songs. And I, I wonder if people would buy into this. So I won't have a bass player. I won't call Neil and I won't call, you know, Tom Wright to play guitar as much as he loves Elvis and would sound amazing. And I remember talking to Neil Fairclough about this. And I said, Neil, I hope you don't take offense to this, but I think I'm going to do an Elvis show with just me and a drummer. And he said, that is genius. And I went, really? He said, no, mate, that's brilliant. He said, don't ever think about calling me for that. He said, you can carry that with your left hand because I've got quite a busy left hand. He said, that will sound amazing, mate. And it will sound so unique. And, and I thought, you know what? You're right. Okay. I'm going to go with this. I'm going to, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I think the Elvis world could do with this a, a slight different stance. And when I think about Elvis at the beginning in 19, what, 1954, when he recorded That's All Right, Mama, it was him on acoustic guitar. It was Scotty Moore on electric guitar and Bill Black on bass, on double bass. There was no drums and there was no piano. I thought, well, how weird is that? So I'll go back to the beginning of Roots music and I'll do it with piano and drums, no bass, no guitar and no acoustic guitar. And, and that's what we did. And we put a show on at the Capitol Theatre in Horsham. It sold out in one day. I couldn't believe that. That, I mean, I mean, a lot of people knew that I loved Elvis Presley. And a lot of people knew that this was going to be the big 40th. And and by the time, as I say, the success of Billy Joel's songbook, I think people trusted me that if I'm going to take on Elvis, he, he's going to do it justice. And I, I'm very, very proud of that. And um, I did my best. And I feel we did do it justice. And what happened was, was that uh, the same guy that had organized the fantastic team of directors and cameramen for the Billy Joel songbook, said to me about two weeks before the show, he said, mate, he said, are you filming this? And I said, no, mate, I can't afford it. I can't afford to do that again. He said, don't worry about the money. He said, listen, you got to at least capture it for your own library purposes, for your own sake. He said, mate, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll send three cameras. I went, you can't do that. He said, no, mate, don't worry. Listen, you know, pay me, pay me something at some point. And so he sent three cameras and we placed one at the back, one stage right at the bottom, looking up uh, at the piano from one end and one off in the wings, looking across the stage and they filmed the show. And that's when Matt Daniel Baker, who co-wrote the Elvis show with me, as well as the Billy Joel songbook, he's a phenomenal talent is Matt Daniel Baker in his own right. He's a mind reader. He's a world renowned mind reader, but he's also an ex actor who has a gift for words 
and a gift for staging and a gift for, he's a visionary. And he said, let me look at this video. And he said, mate, let me do it. Please let me, let me put this video together. I know exactly what I can do with it. And Steve, who, whose company it was agreed and let Matt Daniel Baker, um, direct this movie and edit this movie together and the movie got nominated again and Matt got a nomination for best director Vero mare quante belle Spiro dan do sentimento Di mamme che ti era When we kiss my heart's on fire Burning with a strange desire Soriento from Elio Pace presents Elvis Presley, his tour with just himself on piano and keyboards and a drummer. The one thing Elio didn't tell us was how he chose the drummer for this tour. This is a guy called Steve Rushton, who, I mean, he had played on A Seat at My Table, my album. He would played drums on Take You Home, would you believe it? I got him in for two songs I wanted him to do the sort of jazzier versions, the swing stuff. So he played on Take You Home and he played on a song called Thinking on My Seat at My Table album. He'd also come along and did something we did for children in need once. I met him uh, again on the Weekend Wogan show when he came along to the Palladium to perform with the band that he'd been in for years, which is the Imelda May band. And he has played with everybody. Um, I mean, just everybody. He's one of the most renowned drummers in the business, an incredible reader and an incredible drummer and a real personality on stage. And I thought if Steve is available, he'll be my guy. I didn't know he could play the piano as well. I didn't know he could sing as well as he does. Um, And so I asked him and I said, you know, I'm thinking about doing this Elvis show in a few months time. Would you be up for this? It'll be just you and me. He said, yeah, Mike. Oh, I said, I'd love to. He said, I actually play in another duo with just another keyboard player, an organist or something. And uh, he said, it really works. I went, well, I've never done it before, but, but I need someone like you who can carry the vibe of this, who can, 
you know, who, who can fill in the gaps, the, all the orchestration that's missing. You know, I can do is I'm a busy piano player. I need you to be as busy as you can on the drums. He agreed to it. And well, you can see for yourself, you can hear the results of it. I think the two of us made a pretty huge sound considering that we are talking about a piano and a drummer. Um, I'm very, very proud of what we achieved with that. Pace and the Elvis Presley song Clean Up Your Own Backyard It's Harvey on Nova FM through until 1 o'clock today. My special guest on Nova FM since 10 o'clock this morning has been singer, songwriter piano player Elio Pace If you're enjoying the interview, let me know. It's harvey.williamson at novafm.co.uk Let's go back to where we started. We started off talking about the concert he managed to pull off on uh, Bank Holiday Weekend in Mattersea. An outdoor event with an audience, a socially distanced audience, 200 people there, one concert on Sunday night, and then because it was fully booked, a second one on the Monday evening. At the end of the concert, he let slip a little bit about what the future holds for Elio Pace and for the Billy Joel songbook. I asked him again about that to try and draw some more information out of him. Let's see what he said. I did. I did. I shouldn't have even mentioned it, but I got excited, you know, because there is, there is something in the pipeline that uh, is, is not just another rung up on the ladder. It's quite frankly, a whole other ladder and it's much higher than the, the rung on this one I'm on. Uh, it's it's a whole new ball game for the Billy Joel songbook, and I'm I'm desperate to tell the world. And I think, to be honest, it's going to be one of those things that doesn't come from me. It won't be something that I announce first. It'll be announced by another person. And um, I don't think we have long to wait. I think a couple of months' time, and uh, we'll announce. But something very very lovely is supposed to be happening to the Billy Joel songbook next autumn. Who knows, Harvey? We don't know what is going to happen in three months' time, let alone 12 months' time. We don't know, do we? You know, this this whole COVID situation, this whole world-changing event that's happened has thrown so much out of line. Um, I really, I really don't know. But I'm about to sign the contract. I know... They've put things in place for things to happen. And I am just chomping at the bit to announce a, a big, a big change in the Billy Joel songbook. Well, we'll have to wait and see what that big change in the Billy Joel songbook is. As soon as we find out, we will let you know here on Nova FM. A big thank you to Elio for spending the time with me today. That has been a really interesting interview. Hope you've all enjoyed it. And if you'd like to check out Elio and find out more about him, have a look at his website. It's eliopace.com. Elio is E-L-I-O, Pace, P-A-C-E dot com. Well, let's go back to his album, A Seat at My Table. I've got one more track to play you from that. This one's called You Love Me Too. I just can't believe it You caught me by surprise 
Yesterday you held me And now today your eyes tell me With all the things I can do I can't pretend you loved me too 